Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the January 2022 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of Unity of the Working Class Against Fascism from 1935 by Georgi Dimitrov. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this is the first time that we're doing an audiobook from Dimitrov, or Dimitrov as you may pronounce it. So we'll start off by reading his biography from Marxists.org, the Marxists Internet Archive. And before we get to that even, I'll mention that the reason that I'm doing this file right now in the first place is the other day we did a file from Mao, some questions concerning methods of leadership, and that text referenced two others, Stalin's Prospects of the Communist Party in Germany, and this one. So sometimes it's just fun to follow up on the footnotes, round out the context. After all, this is what Mao was reading at the time, or thinking about at the time that he was writing that file, so, you know, why don't we read it too? All right, so Georgi Mikhailovich Dimitrov was born June 18, 1882, in Kovachevtsi, Bulgaria. He died July 2, 1949, near Moscow, USSR. He was a long-standing leader of the Bulgarian Communist Party, returned to Bulgaria in November 1945, and began the statification of the Bulgarian economy. He showed a degree of independence of Stalin, talking to Tito, and the Romanians about a Southeast European Socialist Federation. And early in 1948, he was eased out of leadership by Stalin and died in July 1949. A printer and trade union leader, Dimitrov led the Bulgarian Socialist Parliamentary Opposition to the voting of national war credits in 1915. This was, of course, World War I. And he played a major role in the formation of the Bulgarian Communist Party in 1919. So, capitalism tends to be defeated where it's weakest at a given time. So, Europe, after or at the end of World War I, you know, we saw, for example, the Russian Revolution in 1917, and a short-lived Romanian Revolution, as well as revolutionary moments in Italy and Germany, which did not result in revolution. But basically, this was a time of upsurge for socialism, communism as a movement, so hence the formation of the party in 1919, continuing. Imprisoned for sedition. Sedition is basically um, treasonous speech, I guess you could say. In 1918, after continual protest of the World War, and uh, that's not unlike people like Eugene Debs, also imprisoned for sedition for the exact same reason. Shortly after his release, he moved to the Soviet Union. By 1921, he was elected to the executive committee of the Comintern, the third communist international. Two years later, he moved back to Bulgaria, where he led a workers' revolt that was brutally crushed by the capitalist government. Sentenced to death, Dimitrov escaped from Bulgaria and traveled to Germany. By 1929, in Berlin, Dimitrov was elected the head of the Central European section of the Comintern. On February 27, 1933, the newly elected leader of the Nazi party, Adolf Hitler, convicted Dimitrov and scores of other communists as being responsible for having set fire to the German parliament building, the Reichstag. Dimitrov was arrested and put to trial at Leipzig. Dimitrov's aggressive defense, coupled with worldwide attention on the proceedings of the trial, caused the court to find him not guilty, and he was released. Comment there, the Reichstag fire was a turning point in the history of Germany at that time and really kind of marked the beginning of the rapid rise of fascism, specifically Nazism in Germany's case. Basically, shortly after Hitler was appointed, not elected, Chancellor of Germany by the President of Germany, the Reichstag caught fire in the night and burned, and Hitler and the Nazis accused the communists of having set fire to it and basically made it out to be the beginning of a communist uprising, and then set out to severely curtail civil liberties using the Reichstag Fire Decree and the Enabling Act. So were the communists responsible? Not according to the communists. So mainly the fire was blamed on a Dutch ex-communist named Marinus van der Lubbe, who was put on trial along with a handful of other people, again including Dimitrov, According to Dimitrov, senior Nazi leadership had orchestrated the fire for their own political benefit. So 
If anybody is familiar with this channel, you know I don't believe the official government version of 9-11, and I have a number of videos on the channel to that effect. Check out the 9-11 Truth for Socialists playlist that I put together if you want to know more about that. But basically at the time, uh, people compared 9-11 to the Reichstag fire because you had this spectacular event, very symbolic, uh, that was blamed on the public enemy du jour, the terrorists, as George W. Bush would put it, and they passed the Patriot Act in the wake of this. And then literally for the next five or six years, every single thing was because of 9-11, because of 9-11, and the U.S., initiated a gigantic new round, in fact, a meta war, the global war on terror, uh, which we're still in the throes of all of this from 20 years ago. They really got the ball rolling. So a lot of people at the time, back in 2002, 3, 4, were comparing 9-11 to the U.S.'s, you know, own Reichstag fire. Obviously some historical differences, but possibly some similarities as well. Anyway, so Dimitrov did beat the rap. Some actually were convicted, but he was not. Continuing, Dimitrov moved back to the USSR, where he was elected general secretary of the Communist International. He would end up being the last general secretary of the Comintern, 1935 to 1943, as it was extinguished by Stalin in 1943. We'll be covering those events later on on the channel. My understanding is basically this was a move to appease the U.S. and U.K. Dimitrov played a strong role in the anti-Nazi movement, encouraging popular front movements and directing Bulgaria's guerrilla resistance against its own Axis government. In 1945, after the military defeat of the Nazis and the following Bulgarian revolution, Dimitrov returned to Bulgaria and was immediately appointed prime minister, of the newly created socialist government. Assuming dictatorial control of political affairs, he constructed Bulgaria along Stalinist lines, and by 1946 proclaimed the formation of the Bulgarian People's Republic. Two years later, as a result of his lax adherence to the Kremlin, he was eased out of power in early 1948 and died one year later while visiting Moscow. All right, so that's the MIA bio of Dimitrov with a few enhancements from me. Let's now switch over to the audiobook, Unity of the Working Class Against Fascism, the concluding speech before the Seventh World Congress of the Communist International. This was delivered August 13, 1935, so in terms of the Germany timeline, this is about two and a half years after the Reichstag fire, so the Nazi Party's consolidation of power was well underway and events were in progress towards World War II. The source of this text is Dimitrov Georgi Selected Works, Volume 2, Sophia Press, 1972, HTML Transcription and Markup by Matthias Bismo. So, there are a couple of different sections of this, so I'll read the table of contents first, seven sections to be specific. The struggle against fascism must be complete is section one, then United Proletarian Front, or Anti-Fascist Popular Front, then the role of social democracy and its attitude towards the united front of the proletariat, then the united front government, then attitude towards bourgeois democracy, then a correct line alone is not enough, finally cadres. And as usual, if anyone out there listening would like to note the timestamps for the beginning of each of those sections, starting with the reading of the title, and then post them in a comment, I'll put them in the video description. All right, so we begin with an introduction. Comrades, the very full discussion on my report bears witness to the immense interest taken by the Congress in the fundamental tactical questions and tasks of the struggle of the working class against the offensive of capital and fascism and against the threat of an imperialist war. Summing up the eight-day discussion, we can state that all the principal propositions contained in the report have met with the unanimous approval of the Congress. None of the speakers objected to the tactical line we have proposed or to the resolution which has been submitted. I venture to say that at none of the previous Congresses of the Communist International has such ideological and political solidarity been revealed as at the present Congress. The complete unanimity displayed at the Congress indicates that the necessity of revising our policy and tactics in accordance with the changed conditions and on the basis of the extremely abundant and instructive experience of the past few years, has come to be fully recognized in our ranks. 
This unanimity may undoubtedly be regarded as one of the most important conditions for success in solving the paramount immediate problem of the international proletarian movement, namely establishing unity of action of all sections of the working class in the struggle against fascism. The successful solution of this problem requires first that communists skillfully wield the weapon of Marxist-Leninist analysis while carefully studying the actual situation and the alignment of class forces as these develop and that they plan their activity and struggle accordingly. We must mercilessly root out the weakness not infrequently observed among our comrades for cut-and-dried schemes, lifeless formulas, and ready-made patterns. We must put an end to the state of affairs in which communists, when lacking the knowledge or ability for Marxist-Leninist analysis, substitute for it general phrases and slogans such as the revolutionary way out of the crisis, without making the slightest serious attempt to explain what must be the conditions, the relationship of class forces, the degree of revolutionary maturity of the proletariat and mass of working people and the level of influence of the Communist Party for making possible such a revolutionary way out of the crisis. Without such an analysis, all these catchwords become dud shells, empty phrases which only obscure our tasks of the day. Without a concrete Marxist-Leninist analysis, we shall never be able, correctly, to present and solve the problem of fascism, the problems of the proletarian united front and the popular front, the problem of our attitude to bourgeois democracy, the problem of a unified front government, the problem of the processes going on within the working class, particularly among the social democratic workers, or any of the numerous other new and complex problems with which life itself and the development of the class struggle confront us now and will confront us in the future. Second, we need live people, people who have grown up from the masses of the workers, have sprung from their everyday struggle, people of militant action, wholeheartedly devoted to the cause of the proletariat, people whose brains and hands will give effect to the decisions of our Congress. Without Bolshevik, Leninist cadres, we shall be unable to solve the enormous problems that confront the working people in the fight against fascism. Third, we need people equipped with the compass of Marxist-Leninist theory, without the skillful use of which they turn into narrow-minded and short-sighted practitions, unable to look ahead, who take decisions only from case to case and lose the broad perspective of the struggle, which shows the masses where we are going and where we are leading the working people. Fourth, we need the organization of the masses in order to put our decisions into practice. Our ideological and political influence alone is not enough. We must put a stop to reliance on the hope that the movement will develop of its own accord, which is one of our fundamental weaknesses. We must remember that without persistent, prolonged, patient, and sometimes seemingly thankless organizational work on our part, the masses will never make for the communist shore. In order to be able to organize the masses, we must acquire the Leninist art of making our decisions the property not only of the communists, but also of the widest masses of working people. We must learn to talk to the masses, not in the language of book formulas, but in the language of fighters for the cause of the masses, whose every word and every idea reflect the innermost thoughts and sentiments of millions. It is primarily with these problems that I should like to deal in my reply to the discussion. Comrades, the Congress has welcomed the new tactical lines with great enthusiasm and unanimity. Enthusiasm and unanimity are excellent things, of course, but it is still better when these are combined with a deeply considered and critical approach to the tasks that confront us, with a proper mastery of the decisions adopted and a real understanding of the means and methods by which these decisions are to be applied to the particular circumstances of each country. After all, we have unanimously adopted good resolutions before now, but the trouble was that we not infrequently adopted these decisions in a formal manner, and at best made them the property of only the small vanguard of the working class. Our decisions did not become flesh and blood for millions of people, nor a guide to their actions. Can we assert that we have already finally abandoned this formal approach to adopted decisions? No. It must be said that even at this Congress, the speeches of some of the comrades gave indication of vestiges of formalism. A desire made itself felt at times to substitute for the concrete analysis of reality and living experience some sort of new scheme, 
some sort of new, oversimplified, lifeless formula to represent as actually existing that which we desire, but what does not yet exist. First section, the struggle against fascism must be concrete. No general characterization of fascism, however correct in itself, can relieve us of the need to study and take into account the special features of the development of fascism and the various forms of fascist dictatorship in the individual countries and at its various stages. It is necessary in each country to investigate, study, and ascertain the national peculiar ties, the specific national features of fascism, and to map out accordingly effective methods and forms of struggle against fascism. Lenin persistently warned us against such, quote, stereotyped methods, such mechanical leveling and identification of tactical rules, of rules of struggle. This warning is particularly to the point when it is a question of fighting an enemy who so subtly and Jesuitically exploits the national sentiments and prejudices of the masses and the anti-capitalist inclinations in the interests of big capital. Such an enemy must be known to perfection from every angle. We must, without any delay whatever, react to his various maneuvers, discover his hidden moves, be prepared to repel him in any arena and at any moment. We must not hesitate even to learn from the enemy if that will help us more quickly and more effectively to wring his neck. So quick comment there. I think that this is a super important point in understanding what fascism is in relation to capitalism and class struggle. So we're talking about an enemy who, according to Dimitrov, exploits the national sentiments and prejudices of the masses and the anti-capitalist inclinations, but in the interests of big capital. So we have a playlist that this video is going into, Understanding Right-Wing Movements and Fascism. I encourage you to check that out because we have done a number of texts now on this subject of Italian fascism and German, you know, fascism in general. One of the things here is when you have a revolutionary moment which fails for one reason or another, fascism is often a response from the bourgeoisie, not necessarily primarily as a punitive punishing move, but in order to prevent further revolution, like in other words, the bourgeoisie recognizes that the working class is getting really close to revolution. They just had a close call. Um, so what do they do with that revolutionary energy? They take class struggle and the revolutionary energy behind it, and they spin it deftly. Uh, I mean, at least successful fascists do this, but this is the overall aim that they have. They're trying to spin that revolutionary energy into support for the status quo. How do they do that? Well, you take class struggle, class war, and you spin it into the struggle for national unity against a racial enemy, for example, turning class struggle into racial struggle. And basically trying to do class collaborationist politics by pulling together the diametrically opposed interests of the bourgeoisie of a nation and its working class. You know, these are diametrically opposed. What's good for the bourgeoisie is bad for the proletariat. What's good for the proletariat is bad for the bourgeoisie. But fascists come in and say, for the sake of the nation, we must all unite together. And they might even make a few token uh, reforms like might reign in the bourgeoisie a little bit here and there, at least in the beginning. You know, in, uh, we're all going to make a little sacrifice for the good of the country together. Uh, this is the typical fascist plea. So taking radical rhetoric, but spinning it in a right-wing direction. This is a hallmark of fascism. It becomes kind of a, a parody and a mockery of communist rhetoric, except nobody's laughing because the results are disgusting, violent, traumatic, painful, and uh, it's a very difficult enemy to fight because a lot of people fall for this. A lot of workers who are kind of confused, they'll hear something that sounds somewhat radical, but they won't be able to understand that it's actually being spun back to help the bourgeoisie, and hence they get sucked up into it. So I think that that's a very good phrasing, uh, that the enemy, the fascist, exploits the anti-capitalist inclinations in the interests of big capital. You would think, how is that even possible? But look at the history of fascism to, uh, to learn. All right, let's continue. It would be a gross mistake to lay down any sort of universal scheme of the development of fascism, valid for all countries and all peoples. Such a scheme would not help, but would hamper us in carrying on a real struggle. 
Apart from everything else, it would result in indiscriminately thrusting into the camp of fascism those sections of the population which, if properly approached, could at a certain stage of development be brought into the struggle against fascism, or could at least be neutralized. Let us take, for example, the development of fascism in France and in Germany. Some comrades believe that, generally speaking, fascism cannot develop as easily in France as in Germany. What is true and what is false in this contention? It is true that there were no such deep-seated democratic traditions in Germany as there are in France, which went through several revolutions in the 18th and 19th centuries. It is true that France is a country which won the war and imposed the Versailles Treaty on other countries, that the national sentiments of the French people have not been hurt as much as they have been in Germany, where this factor played such a great part. Comment, uh, kind of the German victimhood were being made to pay unfairly for, you know, all the other parties in World War I. It is true that in France, the basic masses of the peasantry are pro-republic and anti-fascist, especially in the South, in contrast to Germany, where even before fascism came to power, a considerable section of the peasantry was under the influence of reactionary parties. But comrades, notwithstanding the existing differences in the development of the fascist movement in France and in Germany, notwithstanding the factors which impede the onslaught of fascism in France, it would be short-sighted not to notice the uninterrupted growth there of the fascist peril, or to underestimate the possibility of a fascist coup d'etat. Moreover, a number of factors in France favor the development of fascism. One must not forget that the economic crisis, which began later in France than in other capitalist countries, continues to become deeper and more acute, and that this greatly encourages the orgy of fascist demagogy. Quick comment. What's the economic crisis that Dimitrov is talking about? Well, six years prior to this, you had the crash of 1929, which ushered in the Great Depression. This affected the entire imperialist world because, you know, the world market is connected. Prior to this, in the 1920s, you know, as the various countries licked their wounds and rebuilt following World War I, U.S. capital helped in part to give some stability to, for example, the Weimar Republic in Germany. As we covered in the file yesterday, the prospects of the German Communist Party, Stalin 1925, Stalin was talking about how the Morgan Group, J.P. Morgan, in the United States, was helping to give whatever degree of stability the German Weimar Republic was able to have during that time. As we covered then also, there was a communist uprising in 1919, which was put down, and then the Weimar government was governed by Social Democrats, basically the opportunists from the Second International, who had betrayed the working class and the communist cause. Eventually, the Weimar Republic would suffer incredible instability, hyperinflation, unemployment, all kinds of disruptions. But for a while, you know, when it was uh, the key time to stave off communist revolution, there was that capital flowing in to try to keep this going in a direction that would work for the imperialists. And then, of course, after the crash of 1929, really everything kind of fell apart, hit the fan, and in the early 30s, as we covered, Nazis come to power, and things start going in a really different direction. To take a parallel, again, this is not one-to-one, -one, but to just think in terms of rough approximations with some similar and some different principles. Uh, we've been seeing the rise of the far right in the last couple of decades, like, really sharply. Well, 2008, global economic crash, the rise of right-wing populism. In other words, fascism, or at least crypto-fascism. That's a real thing. So, anyway, here Dimitrov is talking about the economic crisis in France being one of the factors which lends itself to the development of fascism. So, let's continue there. French fascism holds strong positions in the army among the officers, such as the National Socialists did not have in the Reichswehr before their advent to power. Furthermore, in no other country, perhaps, has the parliamentary regime been corrupted to such an enormous extent and caused such indignation among the masses as in France, and the French fascists, as we know, use this demagogically in their fight against bourgeois democracy. Nor must it be forgotten that the development of fascism is furthered by the French bourgeoisie's keen fear of losing its political and military hegemony in Europe. Hence it follows that the successes scored by the anti-fascist movement in France 
of which comrades Torre and Cachin have spoken here, and over which we so heartily rejoice, are still far from indicating that the working masses have definitely succeeded in blocking the road to fascism. We must emphatically stress once more the great importance of the tasks of the French working class in the struggle against fascism, of which I have already spoken in my report. So commenting there, fast forward five years to the fall of France, 1940, when in fact the Vichy government in France, officially independent from Nazi Germany, but having a policy of collaborating with Nazi Germany, came to power for about four years. Continuing, it would likewise be dangerous to cherish illusions regarding the weakness of fascism in other countries where it does not have a broad mass base. We have the example of such countries as Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Finland, where fascism, although it had no broad base, came to power, relying on the armed forces of the state, and then sought to broaden its base by making use of the state apparatus. Comrade Dutt of England was right in his contention that there has been a tendency among us to contemplate fascism in general, without taking into account the specific features of the fascist movement in the various countries, erroneously classifying all reactionary measures of the bourgeoisie as fascism, and going so far as calling the entire non-communist camp fascist. The struggle against fascism was not strengthened, but rather weakened, in consequence. Even now, we still have survivals of a stereotyped approach to the question of fascism. When some comrades assert that Roosevelt's New Deal represents an even clearer and more pronounced form of the development of the bourgeoisie toward fascism than the national government in Great Britain, for example. Is this not a manifestation of such a stereotyped approach to the question? One must be very partial to hackneyed schemes, not to see that those who are most partial to reactionary circles of American finance capital, which are attacking Roosevelt, are above all the very force which is stimulating and organizing the fascist movement in the United States, not to see the beginnings of real fascism in the United States behind the hypocritical outpouring of these circles, quote, in defiance of the democratic rights of the American citizen, is tantamount to misleading the working class in the struggle against its worst enemy. Let's just break that down for a second. Dimitrov is saying that there are some comrades who are saying that FDR's New Deal was an even clearer form of like a tendency toward fascism than the UK's national government. So although we can't speak about the specific reasons why anyone has made that argument, just because Dimitrov didn't mention them here, we do know that Dimitrov is criticizing them on the basis that in reality, they could see that the most reactionary circles within US finance capital were vigorously attacking Roosevelt. So. These were the people most likely to organize actual fascism, and they were very unhappy with Roosevelt, which is true. So, in other words, the fascists would have done something different than the New Deal. They would have done something different than Roosevelt was doing. These were not actually steps towards the kind of fascism that U.S. fascists at that time, the people trying to organize such a thing, would have been doing. Not to say that the New Deal was socialist or communist or anything like that, but that it was not the most fascist thing going on in the United States by far. So Dimitrov concludes that paragraph with, not to see the beginnings of real fascism in the United States behind the hypocritical outpourings of these circles, these reactionary circles within finance capital, quote, in defense of the democratic rights of the American citizen, unquote, is tantamount to misleading the working class in the struggle against its worst enemy. So Dimitrov is saying the working class's worst enemy, the reactionary circles of finance capital, was trying to mount some kind of an offensive. And if socialists aren't directing the working class towards regarding them as its worst enemy, this is very misleading. Particularly with this phrase, in defense of the democratic rights of the American citizen. I'm not familiar with that particular phrase, but it sounds to me like this may have been a slogan that some people were using against the New Deal, although specifically in what way, I'm not sure, and Dimitrov does not elaborate. However, I'd like to add, before getting back to the text, that this exact year, 1935, was the year that author Sinclair Lewis published It Can't Happen Here, which is basically his account of... Uh, 
This guy, Sinclair Lewis, I happen to love his works. The guy just had his finger on the pulse of U.S. class society. I feel like he could really, uh, he just was very fluent in the various peculiarities of the existing U.S. classes. Anyway, so he did basically a treatment of what if a Hitler or Mussolini-type figure rose to power in the United States? What would it look like? How would it work? And how would the different classes in the United States react? It was, again, this exact year, 1935, so I would highly recommend checking that out. Throw it in your fiction stack. It's an entertaining and really thought-provoking read, I think. I haven't read it in a while, but, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll do it as an audiobook. Anyway, continuing. In the colonial and semi-colonial countries also, as was mentioned in the discussion, certain fascist groups are developing. But, of course, there can be no question of the kind of fascism that we are accustomed to see in Germany, Italy, and other capitalist countries. Here, we must study and take into account the quite special economic, political, and historical conditions, in accordance with which fascism is assuming, and will continue to assume, peculiar forms of its own. Unable to approach the phenomena of real life concretely, some comrades who suffer from mental laziness substitute general, non-committal formulas for a careful and concrete study of the actual situation and the relationship of class forces. They remind us not of sharpshooters who shoot with unerring aim, but of those crack riflemen who regularly and unfailingly miss the target, shooting either too high or too low, too near or too far. But we, comrades, as communist fighters in the labor movement, as the revolutionary vanguard of the working class, want to be sharpshooters who unfailingly hit the target. So that's the end of the first section, going on to section two. United Proletarian Front or Anti-Fascist Popular Front. Some comrades are quite needlessly racking their brains over the problem of what to begin with, the United Proletarian Front or the Anti-Fascist Popular Front. Some say that we cannot start forming the Anti-Fascist Popular Front until we have organized a solid united front of the proletariat. Others argue that since the establishment of the United Proletarian Front meets in a number of countries with the resistance of the reactionary part of social democracy. It is better to start at once with building up the popular front and then develop the united working class front on this basis. So just a quick comment here, as you may have figured out from context or maybe not, the difference between a united front and the popular front is the united front is of proletarian parties, while the popular front includes non-proletarian parties. So, for example, today in the United States, there are calls to resist and oppose fascism within the Republican Party, its particular tendencies towards fascism, in part through an alliance with the Democratic Party, which is, of course, a bourgeois imperialist party. That would be a popular front type of approach. A united front, on the other hand, would be a coalition of all the various socialist parties and things which are not capitalist in nature. All right, so let's just review this section now. Some say that we cannot start forming the anti-fascist popular front until we have organized a solid united front of the proletariat. Others argue that since the establishment of the united proletarian front meets in a number of countries with the resistance of the reactionary part of social democracy. So commenting there, what's the reactionary part of social democracy? Kind of more like right-wing sock dems, for example, of the type who helped to put down the communist uprising in Germany or really anywhere that, you know, would be social democrat reformers helped to put down a communist uprising, are anti-communist, etc. It is better to start at once with the building up of the popular front and then develop the united working class front on this basis. Okay, so what does Dimitrov say about these two different thoughts? Evidently, both groups fail to understand that the United Proletarian Front and the Anti-Fascist Popular Front are connected by the living dialectics of struggle, that they are interwoven, the one passing into the other, in the process of the practical struggle against fascism, and that there is certainly no Chinese wall to keep them apart. For it cannot be seriously supposed that it is possible to establish a genuine anti-fascist popular front without securing the unity of action of the working class itself, which is the leading force of this anti-fascist popular front. At the same time, 
the further development of the United Proletarian Front depends, to a considerable degree, upon its transformation into a popular front against fascism. Comrades, just picture to yourselves a devotee of cut-and-dried theories of this kind, gazing upon our resolution and contriving his pet scheme with the zeal of a true pedant. First, local united proletarian front from below, then regional united front from below, thereafter united front from above, passing through the same stages, then unity in the trade union movement, after that the enlistment of other anti-fascist parties, this is to be followed by the extended popular front from above and from below, after which the movement must be raised to a higher level, politicized, revolutionized, and so on and so forth. You will say, comrades, that this is sheer nonsense. I agree with you. But the unfortunate thing is that, in some form or other, this kind of sectarian nonsense is still to be found quite frequently in our ranks. How does the matter really stand? Of course, we must strive everywhere for a wide popular front of struggle against fascism. But in a number of countries, we shall not get beyond general talk about the popular front unless we succeed in mobilizing the masses of the workers for the purpose of breaking down the resistance of the reactionary section of social democracy to the proletarian united front of struggle. Primarily, this is how the matter stands in Great Britain, where the working class comprises the majority of the population and where the bulk of the working class follows the lead of the trade unions and the Labour Party. That is how matters stand in Belgium and in the Scandinavian countries, where the numerically small communist parties must face strong mass trade unions and numerically large social democratic parties. In these countries, the communists would commit a very serious political mistake if they shirked the struggle to establish a united proletarian front under cover of general talk about the popular front, which cannot be formed without the participation of the mass working class organizations. In order to bring about a genuine popular front in these countries, the communists must carry out an enormous amount of political and organizational work among the masses of the workers. They must overcome the preconceived ideas of these masses, who regard their large reformist organizations as already the embodiment of proletarian unity. They must convince these masses that the establishment of a united front with the communists means a shift on the part of those masses to the position of the class struggle, and that only this shift guarantees success in the struggle against the offensive of capital and fascism. We shall not overcome our difficulties by setting ourselves much wider tasks here. On the contrary, in fighting to remove these difficulties, we shall, in fact and not in words alone, prepare the ground for the creation of a genuine popular front of struggle against fascism, against the capitalist offensive, and against the threat of imperialist war. The problem is different in countries like Poland, where a strong peasant movement is developing alongside the labor movement, where the peasant masses have their own organizations which are becoming radicalized as a result of the agrarian crisis, and where national oppression evokes indignation among the national minorities. Here, the development of the popular front of struggle will proceed parallel with the development of the united proletarian front, and at times in this type of country, the movement for a general popular front may even outstrip the movement for a working class front. Take a country like Spain, which is in the process of a bourgeois democratic revolution. Can it be said that because the proletariat is split up into numerous small organizations, complete fighting unity of the working class must first be established here before a workers and peasants front against LaRue and Gil Robla is created. There's a footnote there. Alexandro Garcia LaRue was a Spanish politician and leader of the Republican Radical Party. He was a minister of foreign affairs of the first Republican government after the proclamation of the Republic of April 1931. He sided with Franco during the fascist uprising. And then Gil Robla, I don't know why both these have French sounding names, but Spanish reactionary statesman and minister in the LaRue government. Back to the text. By tackling the question in this way, we would isolate the proletariat from the peasantry. We would, in effect, be withdrawing the slogan of the agrarian revolution, and we would make it easier for the enemies of the people to disunite the proletariat and the peasantry, and set the peasantry in opposition to the working class. Yet this, comrades, as is well known, 
was one of the main reasons why the working class was defeated in the October events of 1934 in the Asturias. However, one thing must not be forgotten in all countries, where the proletariat is comparatively small in numbers, where the peasantry and the urban petty bourgeois strata predominate. It is all the more necessary to make every effort to set up a firm, united front of the working class itself, so that it may be able to take its place as the leading factor in relation to all the working people. Thus, comrades, in attacking the problem of the proletarian front and the popular front, there can be no general panacea, cure-all, suitable for all cases, all countries, all peoples. In this matter, universalism, the application of one and the same recipe to all countries, is equivalent, if you will allow me to say so, to ignorance, and ignorance should be flogged, even when it stalks about, nay, particularly when it stalks about, in the cloak of universal cut-and-dried schemes. So that's the end of section two, and I have to say, yes, um, I think that certainly Dimitrov is prescribing, you know, different solutions based on differing situations, to the point, I think, almost of being somewhat confusing, or at least, if not of being confusing, like not in terms of contradicting himself, at least of being unclear. I think that that could have used maybe a little bit more elaboration. Now, to be fair to Dimitrov, he wrote a lot on the subject of fascism, so this may be further clarified in other works. Also, we're still at section two, so perhaps it is further clarified there. But just to try to recap what's been said here, Dimitrov says that the building of the United Proletarian Front and of the Anti-Fascist Popular Front are connected through the dialectics of struggle, they're interwoven, one passes into the other in the process of struggling against fascism. So when you do one, you're going to be doing the other in a way. Although in different situations, in different countries that have different class compositions, you know, some that have a large peasantry, some that have a large proletariat, etc., that is what's going to be the starting point. There is no universal solution here. And different types of countries need to be evaluated according to their particular type. So the first type that he talks about is countries with a large working class, a large proletariat. For example, Belgium, the UK, Scandinavian countries, basically the, quote, more advanced capitalist countries that have strong mass trade unions, large sock dem parties. In these types of countries, you would want to prioritize the united proletarian front, in other words, you can't just talk about a general popular front because the working class is so large. And in any of these cases, the working class is going to be the strongest force, even in a popular front. So here you've got to prioritize that. The unfortunate part is that in a lot of these countries, the communist parties were numerically small in comparison to these more sort of reformist uh, middle of the road sock dem mass organizations. Here, Dimitrov says, basically the effort on the part of the communists means to convince the masses to shift their focus. You know, the masses are already comfortable in thinking that, you know, their trade union or their sock dem party is like already, you know, the epitome of working class unity and strength. However, communists know it's going to take more than that to fight fascism. And that's basically what they've got to convince the working masses of. Then Dimitrov gives the example of Poland where there are national struggles. We've done a few. Um, there are some Rosa Luxemburg texts on the channel which talk about the national oppression going on in Poland. And in a country like that, the popular front will probably be on an even level with the development of the United Proletarian Front. And at times it may even outpace the United Proletarian Front due to the strength of the peasant organizations and the type of consciousness which comes out of the struggles against national oppression which are going on there. Then he gives the example of Spain, which, as he says, was in the process of a bourgeois democratic revolution at the time that is against monarchy. So in that case, the proletariat was split up into numerous small organizations, and because of the character of that situation, it was unlikely that if you waited around to try to unite all these different organizations which were working class in character, but had whatever disagreements they were having. If you waited for them all to be in perfect unity, uh, you'd run out of time and the fascists would have just totally taken over, which, in fact, as he points out, has led to losses already, or had led to losses in Spain by that point. So the idea where you're dealing with a very disunited class, 
You want to get as much unity as you can and involve the peasantry. So, you know, if you can't get all the proletariat to unite, um, get what unity you can between the proletariat and the peasantry, and don't let that disunity, which just works in the favor of the enemies of the working class, uh, you know, set in too deeply. And then as a closing thought, he adds in that, you know, ultimately when we're fighting for socialism, the proletariat is going to be the driving force there. So wherever the peasantry or the urban petty bourgeoisie are, you know, have significant numbers, particularly in comparison to maybe a smaller proletariat in a country where capitalism is less developed, hasn't been running as long, proletarianization, that is the pulling of people into the proletariat, you know, by just capitalism's operating in that country, uh, where that isn't as advanced, you got to take special care to try to center the proletariat, because when we're building socialism, the proletariat needs to be the leading class. So even when involving the urban petty bourgeoisie or the peasantry in a coalition like that, the idea is to set it up so that the proletariat can be the leader, because ultimately that's where society's going, right? We know that the peasantry is going to be proletarianized eventually. A lot of the petty bourgeoisie is as well as capitalism develops. So it is that centering of proletarian interests, which is important in doing any kind of coalition work that involves other sections of the population other than the proletariat. So to me, this answer sort of walks the line of almost being a non-answer because the answer is really different in every country. So that really is kind of the answer in the end. It, it's different for every country. You got to put on your thinking cap, do the analysis. There's not just a set solution. All right, so that's section two. Now going on to section three, the role of social democracy and its attitude toward the united front of the proletariat. Comrades, in view of the tactical problems confronting us, it is very important to give a correct reply to the question of whether, that is to what extent, social democracy at the present time is still the principal bulwark of the bourgeoisie, and if so, where? Some of the comrades who participated in the discussion, comrades Florin and Butt, touched upon this question, but in view of its importance, a fuller reply must be given to it, for it is a question which workers of all trends, particularly social democratic workers, are asking and cannot help asking. It must be borne in mind that in a number of countries, the position of social democracy in the bourgeois state and its attitude toward the bourgeoisie has been undergoing a change. In the first place, the crisis has severely shaken the position of even the most secure sections of the working class, the so-called aristocracy of labor, labor aristocracy, which, as we know, is the main support of social democracy. So comment there, what's the labor aristocracy? This is a term that can have slightly different meanings. Generally, it means a segment of the working class, which is favored, gets slightly better conditions. So like in the case of the United States, the sort of like white male breadwinner type that, you know, that um, support of the nuclear family is kind of held up as this traditional value. So if you conform to that, you may get better treatment. So like some of the labor unions, for example, would... Uh, basically be organized around maintaining the lifestyle of that type of worker, whereas other workers from other demographics were considered more expendable, put into like really bad conditions, etc. So labor aristocracy is, you know, kind of a trade union organized, better treated segment of the working class. So as Dimitrov says, as we know, this is the main support of social democracy. Continuing, these sections too, are beginning more and more to revise their views as to the expediency of the policy of class collaboration with the bourgeoisie. Second, as I pointed out in my report, the bourgeoisie in a number of countries is itself compelled to abandon bourgeois democracy and resort to the terroristic form of dictatorship, depriving social democracy not only of its previous position in the state system of finance capital, but also, under certain conditions, of its legal status persecuting, and even suppressing it. Third, under the influence of the lessons learned from the defeat of the workers in Germany, Austria, and Spain, there's a footnote there, this is referring to the defeat of the German Revolution in 1918 to 1923, I mentioned that earlier, the defeat of the revolutionary movement in Austria in 1934, 
and the defeat of the workers' revolutions in Asturia, Spain, in 1934. Back to the text, a defeat which was largely due to the social democratic policy of class collaboration with the bourgeoisie, and on the other hand, under the influence of the victory of socialism in the Soviet Union as a result of Bolshevik policy and the application of revolutionary Marxism, the social democratic workers are becoming revolutionized and are beginning to turn to the class struggle against the bourgeoisie. The combined effect of this has been to make it increasingly difficult and in some countries actually impossible for social democracy to preserve its former role of a bulwark or pillar of support of the bourgeoisie. So commenting here, basically you have this class collaborationist labor aristocracy, which is like, hey, capitalism isn't so bad. The capitalists are kind of nice to us. We don't need revolution. We just need to, you know, have our trade unions and just sort of do that thing and we'll be treated fair, you know, fair day's wage for a fair day's work. And, you know, just let's just keep capitalism, you know, leave it alone. But Dimitrov says some of this view you know, where uh, the bourgeoisie is getting some cross-class support from the labor aristocracy is getting weakened. Why? Uh, Number one, the depression, which had set in by this time, was like, hey, maybe this isn't so cool after all. Second, as the bourgeoisie resorts to more terroristic uh, methods of governing capitalism, that's not really fun for any workers, even including the labor aristocracy to some extent. And third, Now, in the 1930s, there are a number of examples of the communist struggle playing out, which is giving, you know, some of the labor aristocracy even more ideas about what's possible, whether it's watching the Soviet Union successfully start to construct itself, whether it's watching uh, failed revolutions in Germany and Austria and Spain and why they failed. It's, you know, starting to give uh, some of the workers who previously had maybe sided more with the sock dems and bourgeoisie, uh, it's maybe eroding some of that support. So anyway, continuing. Failure to understand this is particularly harmful in those countries where the fascist dictatorship has deprived social democracy of its legal status. So commenting like, when fascists come to power, they will often make socialist and communist parties of any type illegal. From this point of view, the self-criticism of those German comrades who, in their speeches, mentioned the necessity of ceasing to cling to the letter of obsolete formulas and decisions concerning social democracy, of ceasing to ignore the changes that have taken place in its position, was correct. It's clear that if we ignore these changes, it will lead to a distortion of our policy for bringing about the unity of the working class, and it will make it easier for the reactionary elements of the social democratic parties to sabotage the united proletarian front. The process of revolutionization in the ranks of the social democratic parties, now going on in all countries, is developing unevenly. It must not be imagined that the social democratic workers who are becoming revolutionized will at once, and on a mass scale, pass over to the position of consistent class struggle and will straightaway unite with the communists without any intermediate stages. So let's just repeat that. It must not be imagined that those social democratic working people who are becoming revolutionized or radicalized will at once, and on a mass scale, pass over directly to communism without any intermediate stages in their political development, in other words. Continuing. In a number of countries, this will be a more or less difficult, complicated, and prolonged process, essentially dependent, at any rate, on the correctness of our policy, communist policy, and tactics. We must even reckon with the possibility that, in passing from the position of class collaboration with the bourgeoisie, some social democratic parties and organizations will continue to exist for a time as independent organizations or parties. In such an event, there can, of course, be no thought of such social democratic organizations or parties being regarded as a bulwark of the bourgeoisie. It cannot be expected that workers who are under the influence of those social democratic ideologies of class collaboration with the bourgeoisie, which has been instilled in them for decades, will break with this ideology of their own accord by the action of objective causes alone. No, it's our business, the business of communists, to help them free themselves from the hold of reformist ideology. The work of explaining the principles and program of communism must be carried on patiently, 
in a comradely fashion, and it must be adapted to the degree of development of the individual social democratic workers. Our criticism of social democracy must become more concrete and systematic, and it must be based on the experience of the social democratic masses themselves. It must be borne in mind that primarily by utilizing their experience in the joint struggle with the communists against the class enemy, will it be possible and necessary to facilitate and speed up the revolutionary development of the social democratic workers. There is no more effective way for overcoming the doubts and hesitations of the social democratic workers than by their participation in the proletarian united front. So comment two points there. This is echoing what Stalin said in the last video in this series about how communists need more and more to explain to workers the difference between communists and social democrats and to highlight the inadequacies and insufficiencies of social democracy as an ideology. And I should mention here, if you're used to hearing Lenin talk about social democracy, prior to 1917, uh, social democracy was the blanket term for all of Marxism. This was before the split between the opportunists of the Second International and the communists and the establishing of the Third International, which was communist rather than socialist. Socialist at that point being more associated with uh, the opportunist movement and opportunism in general in the Marxist sense. This is not the general sense of the word, but an opportunist in Marxism is somebody who uh, it's the opposite of sectarian, basically. So there are fundamental class interests, bourgeois and proletarian. An opportunist is somebody who works with bourgeois interests, which are fundamentally opposed to proletarian interests. And then on the other hand, a sectarian is somebody who won't work with somebody who is also proletarian. In other words, not working with people with whom the fundamental interests are not opposed. So in other words, when many of the leaders of the socialist parties of the Second International sold out their workers telling them, hey, go fight in an imperialist war for your national bourgeoisie. This was opportunism. This was aligning with the interests of the national bourgeoisie and not with the proletariat. So social democracy, as we know it today, tends to be more of this reformist welfare capitalism. However, there is some difference between some social democrats think you can forever have reformed capitalism and like that's as good as it gets. Some other social democrats think that you actually should get rid of capitalism over time, but like not through a revolution, just through like gradual reforms until suddenly it's, you know, socialism and not capitalism. It's kind of like the voting in socialism idea. We've talked about this on the channel before when talking about Bernie, particularly in like 2020, of like this is the sort of dividing line between democratic socialists. Like technically a democratic socialist is, well, the term has many different meanings. It can mean a lot of different things. But one of them is more like you believe in socialism. You believe that capitalism should be undone and overthrown, but you're going to do it by like, quote, democratic means, you know, voting it in or something like that. And I don't want to straw man too much. I'm sure that there's like some more nuance to that. But, you know, anyway, that's basically the idea is that you're going to elect lots of socialists and eventually, you know, the bourgeois government is just going to turn into a socialist government sort of on its own accord. Uh, and then there are, you know, social democrats where you want, quote, democracy, in other words, capitalism, and, uh, you know, with some social characteristics. So the way I used to say it is, um, you know, in one case, democracy, or meaning capitalism, when capitalists use that term, is the noun, and social is the adjective, like social democracy. And the other, democratic socialism, you know, socialism is the noun, democratic is the adjective. Then again, there's plenty of democratic socialists who actually don't want to end capitalism. So in a way... <laughs> You know, it's like people just use the term very sloppily in practice. But anyway, the whole point here was once upon a time, particularly prior to 1917, social democracy referred to the entire world of Marxism, both what we would consider revolutionary communists today and, you know, welfare capitalist reformists. And then it split. This is after that split. So when they say social democracy, it's more like today's use of social democracy. So, yeah, anyway. Stalin was saying in the other file, and that's echoed here, that one of the main tasks is like as you close in on a more revolutionary situation where 
the contradictions are really getting escalated and capitalism is resorting to you know terroristic fascistic governance of their system this is the time where it's critical for communists to say hey you working class align with us don't align with the sock dems they're going to betray you look at all the inadequacies and all that stuff so that point remains true to this day it's one of the reasons that i haven't done any in a while but i do the uh hanging with the sock dem gang videos to do exactly that kind of contrast and compare criticism because working people more and more do feel drawn into the politics into the struggle and they have to make choices and they're trying to make rational informed choices about where do they square up politically we got to make that as easy a choice as we possibly can and then as dimitrov adds once the workers are actually in that proletarian united front and fighting against fascism well quote there is no more effective way for overcoming the doubts and hesitations so in other words that's about as far as you have to convince people once they're in the fight the fight itself is going to do a lot of the convincing so anyway along those lines though continuing we shall do all in our power to make it easier not only for the social democratic workers but also for those leading members of the social democratic parties and organizations who sincerely desire to adopt the revolutionary class position to work and fight with us against the class enemy at the same time we declare that any social democratic functionary lower official or worker who continues to uphold the disruptive tactics of the reactionary social democratic leaders who comes out against the united front and thus directly or indirectly aids the class enemy will thereby incur at least equal guilt before the working class as those who are historically responsible for having supported the social democratic policy of class collaboration the policy which in a number of european countries doomed the revolution in 1918 and cleared the way for fascism so coming that's exactly what i'm talking about the betrayal of the workers by those opportunistic socialist leaders doing class collaboration with the bourgeoisie in support of their imperialist war and opposing revolutionary efforts at the end of the war that absolutely cleared the way directly left an open door for the bourgeoisie to launch fascist governments had the revolution happened then this wouldn't have been a question of course there would have been a fight for the revolution that's what a revolution is but you would not have these decades of you know everything that we saw so continuing the attitude to the united front marks the watershed between the reactionary sections of social democracy and the sections that are becoming revolutionary our assistance to the latter the ones that are becoming revolutionary will be the more effective the more we intensify our fight against the reactionary camp of social democracy that takes part in a block with the bourgeoisie david pakman and within the left camp the self-determination of its various elements will take place the sooner the more determinedly the communists fight for a united front with the social democratic parties the experience of the class struggle and the participation of the social democrats in the united front movement will show who in that camp will prove to be left in words and who is really left all right and that's the end of the third section so i think i made all my comments so let's move on to section four the united front government while the attitude of social democracy towards the practical realization of the proletarian united front is generally speaking the chief sign in every country of whether the previous role in the bourgeois state of the social democratic party or of its individual parts has changed and if so to what extent the attitude of social democracy on the issue of a united front government will be a particularly clear test in this respect when a situation arises in which the question of creating a united front government becomes an immediate practical problem this issue will become a decisive test of the policy of social democracy in the given country either jointly with the bourgeoisie which is moving towards fascism against the working class or jointly with the revolutionary proletariat against fascism and reaction not merely in words but in deeds that is how the question will inevitably present itself at the time the united front government is formed as well as while it is in power with regard to the character and conditions for the formation of the united front government or anti-fascist popular front government i think that my report gave what was necessary for general tactical direction 
to expect us over and above this to indicate all possible forms and all conditions under which such governments may be formed would mean to lose oneself in barren conjecture. So commenting, this is kind of an extension of what we were talking about above, about the scenarios of in different countries with different conditions, you know, the emphasis on the united front or the popular front is going to be different and, you know, gets a little just confusing because there are so many different cases. This is kind of an extension of that. Anyway, continuing. I would like to utter a note of warning against oversimplification or the application of cut and dried schemes in this question. Life is more complex than any scheme. For example, it would be wrong to imagine that the United Front government is an indispensable stage on the road to the establishment of proletarian dictatorship. That is just as wrong as the former assertion that there will be no intermediary stages in the fascist countries and that fascist dictatorship is certain to be immediately superseded by proletarian dictatorship. I'm just going to read that again. That assumption that the uh, United Front government is an indispensable stage is just as wrong as the former assertion that there will be no intermediary stages in the fascist countries and that fascist dictatorship is certain to be immediately superseded by proletarian dictatorship. So what he's saying there is that you can't assume anything in terms of the transition from a fascist government to proletarian dictatorship. It might go directly, and it really might not. In the case of Germany, half of Germany did go communist right after being fascist, and half of it did not. And in fact, Germany remains capitalist to this day, having reunited and undone communism. So, you know, really nothing is uh, for certain or formulaic there. Continuing, the whole question boils down to this. Will the proletariat itself be prepared at the decisive moment for the direct overthrow of the bourgeoisie and the establishment of its own power? And will it be able, in that event, to ensure the support of its allies? Or will the movement of the United Proletarian Front and the anti-fascist popular front at the particular stage be in a position only to suppress or overthrow fascism without directly proceeding to abolish the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie? So commenting, in other words, is the most that the popular front or united front going to be able to accomplish is that they end fascism and revert to, you know, more of a liberal governing of capitalism rather than the end of capitalism entirely. In the latter case, it would be an intolerable piece of political short-sightedness and not serious revolutionary politics on this ground alone to refuse to create and support a united front or a popular front government. So in other words, basically saying it is not serious revolutionary politics to say that, you know, if we can't uh, immediately establish communism after undoing fascism, then it's not worth it. You do have to oppose and end fascism because the damage that it can do is immense. You know, being, yes, it's capitalism, but being a basically terroristic form of capitalism, uh, it can do more damage in a shorter period of time than any other kind of capitalism. Continuing, it is likewise not difficult to understand that the establishment of a united front government in countries where fascism is not yet in power is something different from the creation of such a government in countries where the fascist dictatorship holds sway. In the latter countries, where the fascist dictatorship holds sway, a united front government can be created only in the process of overthrowing fascist rule. In countries where the bourgeois democratic revolution is developing, a popular front government may become the government of the democratic dictatorship of the working class and the peasantry. So in other words, if you have a country where fascism has already taken over the government, the process of forming your united front and, well, it being a government is going to be happening in the process of actually overthrowing fascism because fascism's already in power. And then in countries where the bourgeois democratic revolution is developing, so this is a much less developed country overall, you could have a popular front government, the working class and the peasantry ruling in, you know, kind of an anti-fascist alliance prior to actually the rise of fascism. As I have already pointed out in my report, the communists will do all in their power to support a united front government to the extent that the latter will really fight against the enemies of the people 
and grant freedom of action to the Communist Party and to the working class. The question of whether Communists will take part in the government will be determined entirely by the actual situation prevailing at the time, and such questions will be settled as they arise. No ready-made recipes can be prescribed in advance. So that's the end of Section 4, and I just want to make a comment here that I must confess I've been itching to make uh, here or there. So this question of communists doing all in our power to support a united front government to the extent that the united front government will really fight against the enemies of the people and, and this is key, grant freedom of action to the Communist Party and the working class. So we have an example of a kind of popular front government, the United States under FDR and Truman uh, in World War II, fighting fascism, of course, you know, afterwards uh, absorbing many Nazis into its own government, Operation Paperclip, look it up. Anyway, but, uh, you know, communist organizations such as Communist Party USA did take part in those efforts, did definitely support bourgeois parties that declared themselves to be anti-fascist and, you know, having this kind of class collaborationist uh, anti-fascist alliance for the purpose of defeating the threat of the Axis powers. Okay, but then what happened afterwards? The Red Scare. They completely tossed aside any kind of socialist, communist, anything. There was just this deep purging as the Cold War set in. So this is what you got to look out for, is when you're entering popular front alliances, um, you know, and potentially helping bourgeois, bourgeois sympathetic interests, you got to watch your back. And there does need to be conditional support on the basis of, you know, are the communists actually going to be allowed freedom of action? And anyway, uh, you know, this gets into other subjects, but, you know, to me, that's such like a glaring betrayal. And of course, you know, that happened more in the late 40s after World War II. This was written in 1935. But how much you can trust the uh, bourgeois factions of a popular front, you know, it's uh, I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. And on that note, let's head into Section 5, Attitude Towards Bourgeois Democracy. In his speech, Comrade Lenski pointed out that while mobilizing the masses to repel the onslaught of fascism against the rights of the working people, the Polish party, at the same time, quote, had its misgivings about formulating positive democratic demands, lest this would create democratic illusions among the masses. In other words, uh, giving the masses illusions that bourgeois government could create actual, you know, workers' democracy. The Polish party is, of course, not the only one in which such fear of formulating positive democratic demands exists in one form or another. Where does this fear stem from, comrades? It comes from an incorrect, non-dialectical conception of our attitude toward bourgeois democracy. We communists are unswerving upholders of Soviet democracy, the great example of which is the proletarian dictatorship in the Soviet Union, where the introduction of equal suffrage and the direct and secret ballot has been proclaimed by resolution of the Seventh Congress of Soviets at the very time when the last vestiges of bourgeois democracy are being wiped out in the capitalist countries. This Soviet democracy presupposes the victory of the proletarian revolution, the conversion of private ownership of the means of production into public ownership, the adoption of the road to socialism by the overwhelming majority of the people. This democracy does not represent a final form. It develops and will continue to develop, depending on the further achievements of socialist construction, in the creation of a classless society, and in the overcoming of the survivals of capitalism in economic life, and in the minds of the people. But today, the millions of working people living under capitalism are faced with the necessity of deciding their attitude to those forms in which the rule of the bourgeoisie is clad in the various countries. We are not anarchists, and it is not at all a matter of indifference to us what kind of political regime exists in any given country, whether a bourgeois dictatorship in the form of bourgeois democracy, even with democratic rights and liberties greatly curtailed, or a bourgeois dictatorship in its open, fascist form. While being upholders of Soviet democracy, we shall defend every inch the democratic gains which the working class has wrested in the course of years of stubborn struggle and shall resolutely fight to extend these gains. 
How great were the sacrifices of the British working class before it secured the right to strike, a legal status for its trade unions, the right of assembly and freedom of the press, extension of the franchise and other rights. How many tens of thousands of workers gave their lives in the revolutionary battles fought in France in the 19th century to obtain the elementary rights and the lawful opportunity of organizing their forces for the struggle against the exploiters. The proletariat of all countries has shed much of its blood to win bourgeois democratic liberties and will naturally fight with all its strength to retain them. Our attitude to bourgeois democracy is not the same under all conditions. For instance, at the time of the October Revolution, the Russian Bolsheviks engaged in a life-and-death struggle against all those political parties which, under the slogan of the defense of bourgeois democracy, opposed the establishment of the proletarian dictatorship. The Bolsheviks fought these parties because the banner of bourgeois democracy had at that time become the standard around which all counter-revolutionary forces mobilized to challenge the victory of the proletariat. So commenting, Lenin wrote about this as well. In other words, at that point, defending you know the civil liberties of bourgeois democracy was actually regressive because the proletariat was finally in a position where they could move beyond bourgeois democracy. You know, bourgeois democracy, even with every civil liberty you can imagine, is still a less advanced form than even the earliest stage of socialism, you know, the very beginning of the dictatorship of the proletariat. However, it's really only in that context. If you compare bourgeois democracy with lots of civil liberties versus fascism, for example, which is bourgeois rule without any kind of democratic, you know, or civil rights at all, then yeah, I mean, defend the bourgeois civil liberties against fascism. Now, somebody's got to be thinking about it out there. I know I am. What does this mean for the United States today? Because we're in a situation where things are pretty far gone in terms of, you know, like having real elections and civil rights and, you know, the cops are an unaccountable army that is basically just capable of executing people in broad daylight, as just happened on I-65 in Nashville the other day, where the prison system is done for profit and, you know, just everything else. I mean, we're in a very advanced state of decay when it comes to bourgeois civil liberties. Could it get worse? Yes. And in fact, it is getting worse. I mean, the, there's a thing just happening this week about the like hundreds of books that are being banned. I think it's in Texas, but there's a push to do that all over the country, um, you know, wherever the particularly reactionary uh, factions of the ruling class are, mostly in the Republican Party in that case. But how, how do we actually oppose this stuff? Um, the simplest suggestion that is being posed is, you know, form an alliance of socialist communists and the Democratic Party to oppose the Republican Party. Now, no argument that on many issues, particularly social issues, the Republican Party is the more reactionary party. However, when it comes to any kind of effective resistance to the Republican Party, the Democrats wind up looking like the Washington Generals, the team that always lost to the Harlem Globetrotters. So you have a thing of the Democrats appear to oppose, but probably are controlled opposition. In fact, if you look at who donates to the Democratic Party, they are in fact paid to lose. They're not serious about stopping fascism, so there's that part. They're fascist collaborators, not really opponents of fascism, although there are you know, liberals in the base who would oppose the book banning and things like that. The party as a whole, though, uh, particularly the upper levels, works directly with on, you know, name a policy. I mean, all kinds of austerity policies, um, yeah, it's not effective opposition to fascism. The Democrats are complicit directly in the curtailing of civil liberties, etc. Then, I mean, as far as part two, do the Democrats want to work with the left? No, they absolutely don't. They're not serious about stopping fascism, but they're very serious about stopping socialism. We've seen that time and time again, even from more moderate Democrats. I've said many times on this channel, I think that a coalition of all the left proletarian elements, excluding the Democratic Party, is the only way to go forward. Unfortunately, these organizations are small in number um, and really have to be built up. There's a ton of organizational work that I just don't think is happening on the level that it needs to happen. But 
I think that the answer is to start doing that work rather than trying to rely on a bourgeois party that honestly would just like to see us go extinct. And at the same time, it's directly colluding with the Republicans on many key issues while, you know, opposing some of the more fringe issues. That's not, to me, the basis of, you know, some kind of a popular front there. That's not realistic. That's not going to be effective. Um, Yeah. So anyway, when voicing these complaints and criticisms about, you know, when people, for example, CPUSA, uh, you know, proposing, oh, you know, let's elect Democrats and this and that. The problem is, um, you know, you can do that all day long and things are just going to keep teetering back and forth between the Democrats and the Republicans because you put the Democrats in power, they're not an anti-fascist force. They're just not. So what happens? They do their thing and then power reverts to the Republicans and it just goes back and forth. In fact, arguably, it's a sophisticated good cop, bad cop, psychological manipulation of the working class voting base. The United States in 2022 obviously has a very advanced proletariat. Proletariat's like 90% of the country. So we don't really need, you know, it's not like we need to lean on the peasantry or something like this. We can build proletarian organizations. In fact, the overwhelmingly fascist, you know, atmosphere of the United States over decades has made organizing very difficult. So many people are in prison or whatever else, but we need to use every opportunity that we can because, yes, fight for bourgeois civil liberties to the extent that you can uh, until, you know, a a moment for revolution becomes available. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody's arguing that. And actually, people need to stop fucking gaslighting uh, when, you know, people say, oh, you're opposed to like, you know, you just want to give it all to the fascists. Like, no, no, no. But like trying to make a strategy with the Democrats, you basically are handing it to the fascists. What I'm saying is we need a coalition of, you know, proletarian elements, a united front here. And just, it seems like nobody's been building it. Um, it's at least not nearly as big as it needs to be. So it's just such a weird, horrible situation that we're in. Uh, anyway, I'm sure we'll come back to this, but my two cents on that. Let's continue with the text. Besides, we have now a situation which differs from that which existed, for example, in the epoch of capitalist stabilization. At that time, the fascist danger was not as acute as it is today. At that time, it was bourgeois dictatorship in the form of bourgeois democracy that the revolutionary workers were facing in a number of countries, and it was against bourgeois democracy that they were concentrating their fire. In Germany, They fought against the Weimar Republic, not because it was a republic, but because it was a bourgeois republic that was engaged in crushing the revolutionary movement of the proletariat, especially in 1918 to 1920 and in 1923. Comment, I believe 23 was the Hamburg uprising. But could the communists retain the same position also when the fascist movement began to raise its head? When, for instance, in 1932, the fascists in Germany were organizing and arming hundreds of thousands of stormtroopers against the working class. Of course not. It was the mistake of the communists in a number of countries, particularly in Germany, that they failed to take account of the changes that had taken place, but continued to repeat the slogans and maintain the tactical positions that had been correct a few years before, especially when the struggle for the proletarian dictatorship was an immediate issue, and when the entire German counter-revolution was rallying under the banner of the Weimar Republic, as it did in 1918-20. to And the circumstance that even today we can still notice in our ranks, a fear of launching positive democratic slogans, indicates how little our comrades have mastered the Marxist-Leninist method of approaching such important problems of our tactics. Some say that the struggle for democratic rights may divert the workers from the struggle for the proletarian dictatorship. It may not be amiss to recall what Lenin said on this question. Quote, it would be a fundamental mistake to suppose that the struggle for democracy can divert the proletariat from the socialist revolution, or obscure or overshadow it, etc. On the contrary, just as socialism cannot be victorious unless it introduces complete democracy, so the proletariat will be unable to prepare for victory over the bourgeoisie unless it wages a many-sided, consistent, and revolutionary struggle for democracy. Unquote. These words should be firmly fixed in the memories of all our comrades, bearing in mind that in history, 
great revolutions have grown out of small movements for the defense of the elementary rights of the working class. But in order to be able to link up the struggle for democratic rights with the struggle of the working class for socialism, it is necessary first and foremost to discard any cut and dried approach to the question of defense of bourgeois democracy. That's the end of that section. Moving on to the next section, a correct line alone is not enough. Comrades, it is clear, of course, that for the Communist International and each of its sections, the fundamental thing is to work out a correct line. But a correct line alone is not enough for concrete leadership in the class struggle. For that, a number of conditions must be fulfilled, above all the following. First, organizational guarantees that adopted decisions will be carried out in practice and that all obstacles in the way will be resolutely overcome. What Comrade Stalin said at the 12th Congress of the CPSUB about the conditions necessary to carry out the party line can and must be applied fully to the decisions taken by our Congress. Comrade Stalin said, quote, Some people imagine that it is quite sufficient to map out a correct party line, to proclaim it so as to bring it to everyone's attention, to set it forth in general theses and resolutions, and to vote it unanimously, and victory will come by itself, so to say, of its own accord. Of course, this is quite wrong. This is a big illusion. Only incorrigible bureaucrats are capable of such reasoning. Fine resolutions and declarations in favor of the general policy of the party are just the beginning because they only indicate a desire for victory, not victory itself. After the correct policy has been outlined and the correct solution indicated, success depends on organizational work, on the organization of the struggle to implement the party line and the proper selection of workers, on the control over the implementation of the decisions on the part of the leading organs. If these are lacking, the correct party line and correct decisions stand a great risk of being seriously impaired. What's more, after the correct policy has been hammered out, everything depends on organizational work, including the political line itself, its implementation or its failure." Unquote. It is hardly necessary to add anything to these words, which must become a guiding principle in the whole work of our party. Another condition is the ability to convert decisions of the Communist International and its sections into decisions of the widest masses themselves. This is all the more necessary now when we are faced with the task of organizing united front of the proletariat and drawing very wide masses of the people into an anti-fascist popular front. The political and tactical genius of Lenin stands out most clearly and vividly in his masterly ability to get the masses to understand the correct line and the slogans of the party through their own experience. If we trace the history of Bolshevism, that greatest of treasure houses of the political strategy and tactics of the revolutionary workers' movement, we shall see that the Bolsheviks never substituted methods of leading the party for methods of leading the masses. Comrade Stalin pointed out that one of the particular features of the tactics of the Russian Bolsheviks on the eve of the October Revolution resided in the fact that they were able to find the roads and turns which led the masses to the slogans of the party and to the very threshold of the revolution in a natural way helping them to feel, check, and recognize the correctness of these slogans through their own experience, that they did not confuse party leadership with leadership of the masses, but clearly saw the difference between the former and the latter, thus elaborating tactics not merely as a science of party leadership, but of the leadership of millions of working people. Furthermore, it must be borne in mind that the masses cannot assimilate our decisions unless we learn to speak a language which they understand. We do not always know how to speak simply, concretely, in images which are familiar and intelligible to the masses. We are still unable to refrain from abstract formulas which we have learnt by rote. As a matter of fact, if you look through our leaflets, newspapers, resolutions, and theses, you will find that they are often written in a language and style so heavy that they are difficult for even our party functionaries to understand, let alone the rank-and-file workers. If we consider, comrades, that the workers, especially in fascist countries, who distribute or only read these leaflets, risk their very lives by doing so, we shall realize still more clearly the need of writing for the masses in a language which they understand, so that the sacrifices made shall not have been in vain. The same applies in no less degree to our oral agitation and propaganda. We must admit quite frankly that, in this respect, the fascists have often proved 
more dexterous and flexible than many of our comrades. I recall, for example, a meeting of unemployed in Berlin before Hitler's accession to power. It was at the time of the trial of those notorious swindlers and profiteers, the Sklarek brothers, which dragged on for several months. A National Socialist speaker, in addressing the meeting, made demagogic use of that trial to further his own ends. He referred to the swindlers, the bribery and other crimes committed by the Sklarek brothers, emphasized that the trial had been dragging on for months, and figured out how many hundreds of thousands of marks it had already cost the German people. To the accompaniment of loud applause, the speaker declared that such bandits as the Sklarek brothers should have been shot without any ado, and the money wasted on the trial should have gone to the unemployed. A communist rose and asked for the floor. The chairman at first refused, but under the pressure of the audience, which wanted to bear a communist, he had to let him speak. When the communist got up on the platform, everybody waited with tense expectation what the communist speaker would have to say. Well, what did he say? Quote, Comrades, he began in a loud and ringing voice, the plenum of the Communist International has just closed. It showed the way to the salvation of the working class. The chief task it puts before you, comrades, is to win the majority of the working class. The plenum pointed out that the unemployed movement must be politicized. The plenum calls on us to raise it to a higher level. The plenum appeals for this movement to be raised to a higher level, unquote. He went on in the same strain, evidently under the impression that he was explaining authentic decisions of the plenum. Could such a speech appeal to the unemployed? Could they find any satisfaction in the fact that we first intended to politicize, then revolutionize, and finally mobilize them in order to raise their movement to a higher level? Sitting in a corner of the hall, I observed with chagrin how the unemployed, who had been so eager to hear a communist, in order to find out from him what to do concretely, began to yawn and display unmistakable signs of disappointment. And I was not at all surprised when, towards the end, the chairman rudely cut our speaker short without any protest from the meeting. This, unfortunately, is not the only case of its kind in our agitational work, nor were such cases confined to Germany. To agitate in such fashion means to agitate against one's own cause. It is high time to put an end, once and for all, to these, to say the least, childish methods of agitation. During my report, the chairman, Comrade Kusinin, received a characteristic letter from the floor of the Congress addressed to me. Let me read it. Quote, In your speech at the Congress, please take up the following question, namely that all resolutions and decisions adopted in the future by the Communist International be written so that not only trained communists can get the meaning, but that any working person reading the material of the Comintern might, without any preliminary training, be able to see at once what the communists want, and of what service communism is to humanity. Some party leaders forget this. They must be reminded of it, and very strongly, too. Also that agitation for communism be conducted in understandable language." Unquote. I do not know exactly who is the author of this letter, but I have no doubt that this comrade voiced in his letter the opinion and desire of millions of workers. Many of our comrades think that the more high-sounding words and the more formulas, often unintelligible to the masses, they use, the better their agitation and propaganda, forgetting that the greatest leader and theoretician of the working class of our epoch, Lenin, has always spoken and written in highly popular language, readily understood by the masses. Every one of us must make this a law, a Bolshevik law, an elementary rule. When writing or speaking, always have in mind the rank-and-file worker, who must understand you, must believe in your appeal, and be ready to follow you. You must have in mind those for whom you write, to whom you speak. That's the end of that section. I'll just add, yes, know your audience. If you're writing for other communists who have put in three or four years of, you know, advanced study, then that's fine, if that's specifically who you're talking to. But if it's not, do try to make sure that it's intelligible. It's why I do these comments. Uh, part of it is, you know, I think just to stay engaged with the material. Um, you know, anytime you read, actually, read with pen in hand. You know, reading should not be a merely passive activity. As ideas come to you, write them in the margins or write them somewhere. You know, if you're reading on a computer, keep a notepad file open, whatever, but write down your thoughts because you should be actively engaged. And 
I try to stay actively engaged when I read. I share that and hopefully, and I have heard, you know, feedback from people that it helps them to stay engaged. Even if you don't agree with 100% of my thoughts on a particular subject, uh, hopefully it is stimulating. It helps you stay engaged and helps your own thinking process. But yeah, be educational. You know, I mean, make sure that what you're saying is understandable. If you think that anything might be going over somebody's heads, then explain it. Say it, but at least back it up and put it in other words. This is really key. Know your audience. And for communists, who's the audience? Usually the masses of the working class, unless, you know, it's something very specific to the contrary. All right. Next section is cadres. Comrades, our best resolutions will remain scraps of paper if we lack the people who can put them into effect. Unfortunately, however, I must state that the problem of cadres, one of the most important questions facing us, has received almost no attention at this Congress. The report of the Executive Committee of the Communist International was discussed for seven days. There were many speakers from various countries, but only a few, and even they only in passing, discussed this question, so extremely vital for the Communist parties and the labor movement. In their practical work, our parties have not yet realized that by far, people, cadres, decide everything. A negligent attitude to the problem of cadres is all the more impermissible, as we are constantly losing some of the most valuable of our cadres in the struggle. For we are not a learned society, but a militant movement which is constantly in the firing line. Our most energetic, most courageous, and most class-conscious elements are in the front ranks. It is precisely these frontline people that the enemy hunts down, murders, throws into jail and concentration camps, and subjects to excruciating torture, particularly in fascist countries. This gives rise to the urgent necessity of constantly replenishing the ranks, cultivating and training new cadres, as well as carefully preserving the existing cadres. The problem of cadres is of particular urgency for the additional reason that under our influence, the mass united front movement is gaining momentum and bringing forward many thousands of new working class militants. Moreover, it is not only voting revolutionary elements, not only workers just becoming revolutionary, who have never before participated in a political movement that stream into our ranks. Very often, former members and militants of the social democratic parties also join us. These new cadres require special attention, particularly in the illegal communist parties, the more so because, in their practical work, these cadres with their poor theoretical training frequently come up against very serious political problems which they have to solve for themselves. The problem of what should be the correct policy with regard to cadres is a very serious one for our parties, as well as for the Young Communist League and for all other mass organizations, for the entire revolutionary labor movement. What does a correct policy with regard to cadres imply? First, knowing one's people. As a rule, there is no systematic study of cadres in our parties. Only recently have the Communist Parties of France and Poland, and in the East, the Communist Party of China, achieved certain successes in this direction. The Communist Party of Germany, before its underground period, had also undertaken a study of its cadres. The experience of these parties has shown that as soon as they begin to study their people, party workers were discovered who had remained unnoticed before. On the other hand, the parties began to be purged of alien elements who were ideologically and politically harmful. It is sufficient to point to the example of Salar and Barbet in France, who, when put under the Bolshevik microscope, turned out to be agents of the class enemy and were thrown out of the party. In Hungary, the verification of cadres made it easier to discover nests of provocateurs, agents of the enemy, who had sedulously concealed their identity. Second, proper promotion of cadres. So, commenting here, I think that this is some of the, what uh, Mao was talking about in the earlier referenced file. Proper promotion of cadres. Promotion should not be something casual, but one of the normal functions of the party. It is bad when promotion is made exclusively on the basis of narrow party considerations, without regard to whether the communist promoted has contact with the masses or not. Promotion should take place on the basis of the ability of the various party workers to discharge particular functions and of their popularity among the masses. We have examples in our parties of promotions which have produced excellent results. For instance, we have a Spanish woman communist sitting in the presidium of this Congress, Comrade Dolores. 
Two years ago, she was still a rank-and-file party worker, but in the very first clashes with the class enemy, she proved to be an excellent agitator and fighter. Subsequently promoted to the leading body of the party, she has proved herself a most worthy member of that body. I could point to a number of similar cases in several other countries, but in the majority of cases, promotions are made in an unorganized and haphazard manner, and therefore are not always fortunate, sometimes moralizers phrasemongers and chatterboxes who actually harm the cause are promoted to leading positions. Third, the ability to use people to the best advantage. We must be able to ascertain and utilize the valuable qualities of every single active member. There are no ideal people. We must take them as they are and correct their weaknesses and shortcomings. We know of glaring examples in our parties of the wrong utilization of good, honest communists who might have been very useful had they been given work that they were better fit to do. Fourth, proper distribution of cadres. First of all, we must see to it that the main links of the movement are in the hands of capable people who have contacts with the masses, who have sprung from the grassroots, who have initiative, and are staunch. The more important districts should have an appropriate number of such activists. In capitalist countries, it is not an easy matter to transfer cadres from one place to another. Such a task encounters a number of obstacles and difficulties, including lack of funds, family considerations, etc., difficulties which must be taken into account and properly overcome. But usually, we neglect to do this altogether. Fifth, systematic assistance to cadres. This assistance should consist in detailed instruction, in friendly checkup, in correction of shortcomings and errors, and in concrete, day-to-day -day guidance of cadres. Sixth, care for the preservation of cadres. We must learn properly to withdraw party workers to the rear whenever circumstances so require and replace them by others. We must demand that the party leadership, particularly in countries where the parties are illegal, assume paramount responsibility for the preservation of cadres. The proper preservation of cadres also presupposes a highly efficient organization of secrecy in the party. In some of our parties, many comrades think that the parties are already prepared for the event of illegality, even though they have reorganized them only formally, according to ready-made rules. We had to pay very dearly for having started the real work of reorganization only after the party had gone underground under the direct heavy blows of the enemy. Remember the severe losses the Communist Party of Germany suffered during its transition to underground conditions. Its experience should serve as a serious warning to those of our parties which today are still legal, but may lose their legal status tomorrow. Only a correct policy in regard to cadres will enable our parties to develop and utilize all available forces to the utmost, and obtain from the enormous reservoir of the mass movement ever fresh reinforcements of new and better active workers. What should be our main criterion in selecting cadres? First absolute devotion to the cause of the working class, loyalty to the party, tested in face of the class enemy, in battle, in prison, in court. Second, the closest possible contact with the masses. The comrades concerned must be wholly absorbed in the interests of the masses, feel the life pulse of the masses, know their sentiments and requirements. The prestige of the leaders of our party organization should be based, first of all, on the fact that the masses regard them as their leaders, and are convinced, through their own experience, of their ability as leaders, and of their determination and self-sacrifice and struggle. Third, ability independently to find one's bearings in given circumstances, and not to be afraid of assuming responsibility in making decisions. Those who fear to take responsibility are not leaders. Those who are unable to display initiative, who say, I will do only what I am told, are not Bolsheviks. Only they are real Bolshevik leaders who don't lose their heads at moments of defeat, who don't get a swelled ego at moments of success, who display indomitable firmness in carrying out decisions. Cadres develop and grow best when they're placed in the position of having to solve concrete problems of the struggle independently and are aware that they're fully responsible for their decisions. Fourth, discipline and Bolshevik hardening in the struggle against the class enemy as well as in their irreconcilable opposition to all deviations from the Bolshevik line. We must place all the more emphasis on these conditions which determine the correct selection of cadres, because in practice, 
preference is very often given to a comrade who, for example, is able to write well and is a good speaker, but is not a man or woman of action, and is not suited for the struggle as some other comrade who may not be able to write or speak so well, but is a staunch comrade, possessing initiative in contact with the masses, and is capable of going into battle and leading others into battle. Have there not been many cases of sectarians, doctrinaires, or moralizers crowding out loyal mass workers, genuine working class leaders? Our leading cadres should combine the knowledge of what they must do with Bolshevik stamina, revolutionary strength of character, and the power to carry it through. In connection with the question of cadres, permit me, comrades, to dwell also on the very great part which the international labor defense is called upon to play in relation to the cadres of the labor movement. The material and moral assistance which the ILD organizations render to our prisoners and their families, to political emigrants, to persecuted revolutionaries and anti-fascists, has saved the lives and preserved the strength and fighting capacity of thousands upon thousands of most valuable fighters of the working class in many countries. Those of us who have been in jail have found out directly, through our own experience, the enormous significance of the activity of the ILD. By its activity, the ILD has won the affection, devotion, and deep gratitude of hundreds of thousands of proletarians and of revolutionary elements among the peasantry and intellectuals. Under present conditions, when bourgeois reaction is growing, when fascism is raging, and the class struggle is becoming more acute, the role of the ILD is increasing immensely. The task now before the ILD is to become a genuine mass organization of the working people in all capitalist countries, particularly in fascist countries, where it must adapt itself to the special conditions prevailing there. It must become, so to speak, a sort of red cross of the united front of the proletariat and of the anti-fascist popular front, embracing millions of working people, the Red Cross of the Army of the Toiling Classes, embattled by fascism, fighting for peace and socialism. If the ILD is to perform its part successfully, it must train thousands of its own active militants, a multitude of its own cadres, ILD cadres, answering in their character and capacity to the special purposes of this extremely important organization. So just to pause for a minute, he's going to go on about the ILD for a little bit. So, as he said, you know, it must become, so to speak, a sort of red cross of the united front of the proletariat. So, in 1922, the Comintern set up the International Red Aid. This was an organization network that provided legal aid and other forms of aid to comrades in trouble, particularly legal trouble. And this is not an entirely unusual formation where you'll have like a party or a union or something, and then a separate organization that is just devoted to, you know, more legal things. Sometimes there are legal reasons for having them separate and so on. Anyway, continuing. And here I must say as categorically and as sharply as possible that while a bureaucratic approach and a soulless attitude towards people is harmful in the labor movement in general, in the sphere of activity of the ILD, such an attitude is an evil bordering on the criminal. The fighters of the working class, the victims of reaction and fascism who are suffering agony in torture chambers and concentration camps, political emigrants and their families, should all meet with the most sympathetic care and solicitude on the part of the organizations and functionaries of the ILD. The ILD must still better appreciate and discharge its duty of assisting the fighters in the proletarian and anti-fascist movement, particularly in physically and morally preserving the cadres of the workers' movement. The communists and revolutionary workers who are active in the ILD organizations must realize at every step the enormous responsibility they have before the working class and the communist international for the successful fulfillment of the roles and tasks of the ILD. Comrades, as you know, cadres received their best training in the process of struggle, in surmounting difficulties and withstanding tests, and also from favorable and unfavorable examples of conduct. We have hundreds of examples of splendid conduct in times of strikes, during demonstrations, in jail, in court. We have thousands of instances of heroism, but unfortunately, also not a few cases of faint-heartedness, lack of firmness, and even desertion. We often forget these examples, both good and bad. 
We do not teach people to benefit by these examples. We do not show them what should be emulated and what rejected. We must study the conduct of our comrades and militant workers during class conflicts, under police interrogation, in the jails and concentration camps, in court, etc. The good examples should be brought to light and held up as models to be followed, and all that is rotten, non-Bolshevik, and Philistine should be cast aside. Since the Reichstag fire trial, we have had quite a few comrades whose statements before bourgeois and fascist courts show that numerous cadres are growing up with an excellent understanding of what really constitutes Bolshevik conduct in court. But how many even of you, delegates to the Congress, know the details of the trial of the railwaymen in Romania, know about the trial of Fiete Schulze, who was subsequently beheaded by the fascists in Germany, the trial of our valiant Japanese comrade Itsukawa, the trial of the Bulgarian revolutionary soldiers, and many other trials at which admirable examples of proletarian heroism were displayed. Such worthy examples of proletarian heroism must be popularized, must be contrasted with the manifestations of faint-heartedness, philistinism, and every kind of rottenness and frailty in our ranks and the ranks of the working class. These examples must be used most extensively in educating the cadres of the workers' movement. Comrades, our party leaders often complain that there are no people, that they are short of people for agitational and propaganda work, for the newspapers, for the trade unions, for work among the youth, among women. Not enough, not enough. That's the cry. We simply haven't got the people. To this, we could reply in the old, yet eternally new, words of Lenin, quote, There are no people, yet there are enormous numbers of people. There are enormous numbers of people because the working class and ever more diverse strata of society, year after year, throw up from their ranks an increasing number of discontented people who desire to protest. At the same time, we have no people because we have no talented organizers capable of organizing extensive and at the same time uniform and harmonious work that would give employment to all forces, even the most inconsiderable." Unquote. These words of Lenin must be thoroughly grasped by our parties and applied by them as a guide in their everyday work. There are plenty of people. They need only to be discovered in our own organizations during strikes and demonstrations, in various mass organizations of the workers, in united front bodies. They must be helped to grow in the course of their work and struggle. They must be put in a situation where they can be really useful to the workers' cause. Comrades, we communists are people of action. Ours is the problem of practical struggle against the offensive of capital, against fascism, and the threat of imperialist war, the struggle for the overthrow of capitalism. It is precisely this practical task that obliges communist cadres to equip themselves with revolutionary theory, for theory gives those engaged in practical work the power of orientation, clarity of vision, assurance in work, belief in the triumph of our cause. But real revolutionary work is irreconcilably hostile to all defanged theorizing, all barren play with abstract definitions. Our theory is not a dogma, but a guide to action, Lenin used to say. It is such a theory that our cadres need, and they need it as badly as they need their daily bread, as they need air or water. Whoever really wishes to rid our work of deadening, cut-and-dried schemes, of pernicious scholasticism, must burn them out with a red-hot iron both by practical, active struggle, waged together with and at the head of the masses, and by untiring effort to master the mighty, fertile, all-powerful teaching of Marx, Engels, Lenin. In this connection, I consider it particularly necessary to draw your attention to the work of our party schools. It is not pedants, moralizers, or adepts at quoting that our schools must train. No, it is practical front-rank fighters in the cause of the working class that should graduate from there. People who are front-rank fighters not only because of their boldness and readiness for self-sacrifice, but also because they see further than rank-and-file workers and know better than they the path that leads to the emancipation of the working people. All sections of the Communist International must, without any dilly-dallying, seriously take up the question of the proper organization of party schools in order to turn them into smithies where these fighting cadres are forged. The principal task of our party schools, it seems to me, is to teach the party and young Communist League members there how to apply the Marxist-Leninist method 
to the concrete situation in particular countries, to definite conditions, not the struggle against an enemy in general, but against a particular definite enemy. This makes necessary a study of not merely the letter of Leninism, but its living revolutionary spirit. There are two ways of training cadres in our party schools. First method, teaching people abstract theory, trying to give them the greatest possible dose of dry learning, coaching them how to write theses and resolutions in a literary style, and only incidentally touching upon the problems of the particular country, the particular labor movement, its history and traditions, and the experience of the Communist Party in question. Second method is theoretical training in which mastering the fundamental principles of Marxism-Leninism is based on practical study by the student of the key problems of the struggle of the proletariat in their own country. On returning to their practical work, the student will then be able to find their bearings by themselves and become an independent practical organizer and leader capable of leading the masses in battle against the class enemy. Not all graduates of our party schools prove to be suitable. There are many phrases, abstractions, a good deal of book knowledge, and show of learning. But we need real, truly Bolshevik organizers and leaders of the masses, and we need them badly this very day. It does not matter if such students cannot write good theses, though we need that very much too, but they must know how to organize and lead, undaunted by difficulties, capable of surmounting them. Revolutionary theory is the generalized, summarized experience of the revolutionary movement. Let me say that again. Revolutionary theory is the generalized, summarized experience of the revolutionary movement. So commenting, this is why, you know, I often label these texts as history slash theory, because it's scientific. You know, science is based, you do an experiment, you, well, first of all, you get an observation, make a hypothesis, make a testable prediction, run an experiment to test the prediction, then you revise and you develop a theory from that experience ongoing, okay? We were doing this in a recent Mao text when I was talking about the scientific method. So, yeah, Marxist theory, it's scientific, it is based on reality, it's trying to understand reality, and we note our observations and conclusions as we move along applying it to reality and seeing what the results are. So yes, revolutionary theory is the generalized, summarized experience, i.e. the history, of the revolutionary movement. Continuing, communists must carefully utilize in their countries not only the experience of the past, but also the experience of the present struggle of other detachments of the international workers' movement. However, correct utilization of experience does not by any means denote mechanical transposition of ready-made forms and methods of struggle from one set of conditions to another, from one country to another, as so often happens in our parties. Bare imitation, simple copying of methods and forms of work, even of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, in countries where capitalism is still supreme, may with the best of intentions result in harm rather than good, as has so often actually been the case. It is precisely from the experience of the Russian Bolsheviks that we must learn to apply effectually to the specific conditions of life in each country, the single international line. In the struggle against capitalism, we must learn pitilessly to cast aside, pillory, and hold up to general ridicule, all phrase-mongering, use of hackneyed formulas, pedantry, and dogmatism. It is necessary to learn, comrades, to learn always at every step, in the course of the struggle, at liberty, and in jail, to learn and to fight, to fight and to learn. Comrades, never has any International Congress of Communists aroused such keen interest on the part of the world public opinion as we witness now in regard to our present Congress. It may be said without fear of exaggeration that there is not a single serious newspaper, not a single political party, not a single more or less serious political or social leader that is not following the course of our Congress with the closest attention. The eyes of millions of workers, peasants, small townspeople, office workers and intellectuals, of colonial peoples and oppressed nationalities are turned towards Moscow, the great capital of the first, but not the last, state of the international proletariat. In this, we see a confirmation of the enormous importance and urgency of the questions discussed at the Congress and of its decisions. The frenzied howling of the fascists of all countries, particularly of rabid German fascism, only confirms us in the belief that our decisions have indeed hit the mark. 
in the dark night of bourgeois reaction and fascism, in which the class enemy is endeavoring to keep the working masses of the capitalist countries. The Communist International, the International Party of the Bolsheviks, stands out like a beacon, showing all mankind the one way to emancipation from the yoke of capitalism, from fascist barbarity and the horrors of imperialist war. The establishment of unity of action of the working class is the decisive stage on that road. Yes, unity of action by the organizations of the working class of every trend, the consolidation of its forces in all spheres of its activity and in all sectors of the class struggle. The working class must achieve the unity of its trade unions. In vain do some reformist trade union leaders attempt to frighten the workers with the specter of a trade union democracy, destroyed by the interference of the communist parties in the affairs of the united trade unions, by the existence of communist factions within the trade unions. To depict us communists as opponents of trade union democracy is sheer nonsense. We advocate and consistently uphold the right of the trade unions to decide their problems for themselves. We are even prepared to forego the creation of communist factions in the trade unions, if that is necessary in the interests of trade union unity. We are prepared to come to an agreement on the independence of the United Trade Unions from all political parties, but we are decidedly opposed to any dependence of the trade unions on the bourgeoisie, and do not give up our basic point of view that it is impermissible for trade unions to adopt a neutral position in regard to the class struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The working class must strive to secure the union of all forces of the working class youth and of all organizations of the anti-fascist youth, and win over that section of the working youth which has come under the demoralizing influence of fascism and other enemies of the people. The working class must and will achieve unity of action in all fields of the labor movement. This will come about sooner the more firmly and resolutely we communists and revolutionary workers of all capitalist countries apply, in practice, the new tactical line adopted by our Congress in relation to the most important, urgent questions of the international workers' movement. We know that there are many difficulties ahead. Our path is not a smooth asphalt road. Our path is not strewn with roses. The working class will have to overcome many an obstacle, including obstacles in its own midst. It faces the task above all of reducing to naught the disruptive machinations of the reactionary elements of social democracy. Many are the sacrifices that will be exacted under the hammer blows of bourgeois reaction and fascism. The revolutionary ship of the proletariat will have to steer its course through a multitude of submerged rocks before it reaches its port. But the working class in the capitalist countries is today no longer what it was in 1914 at the beginning of the imperialist war, nor what it was in 1918 at the end of the war. The working class has behind it 20 years of rich experience and revolutionary trials, bitter lessons of a number of defeats, especially in Germany, Austria, and Spain. The working class has before it the inspiring example of the Soviet Union, the land of victorious socialism, an example of how the class enemy can be defeated, how the working class can establish its own government and build a socialist society. The bourgeoisie no longer holds undivided dominion over the whole expanse of the world. Now, the victorious working class rules over one-sixth of the globe. Soviets rule over a vast part of the great China. Just a quick comment there. So the Chinese Revolution would not be for over a decade later. However, there were communist-controlled areas, so that's, I think, what he's referring to. The working class possesses a firm, well-knit revolutionary vanguard, the Communist International. The whole course of historical development, comrades, favors the cause of the working class. In vain are the efforts of the reactionaries, the fascists of every hue, the entire world bourgeoisie, to turn back the wheel of history. No, that wheel is turning forward, and will continue to turn forward, towards a worldwide union of Soviet socialist republics, until the final victory of socialism throughout the world. There is but one thing that the working class of the capitalist countries still lacks, unity in its own ranks. So let the battle cry of the Communist International, the clarion call of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, ring out all the more loudly from this platform to the whole world. Workers of all countries, unite. And that's the end of the text. So, that was a solid two hours. I have already given really most of my comments and notes. The only thing that I'm going to close by saying 
is I look forward to covering in greater depth the end of the Communist International. I think that the lack of a Communist International is probably the root cause of a lot of problems in the world socialist movement today. Some people might feel that I'm overstating that, and you know what? I'm open to changing my mind on that somewhat. But I think when you have a movement that's fundamentally international, particularly in an age where international communication is so easy and, you know, capital movement also is super easy internationally, um, not having, you know, an international body to coordinate that struggle is kind of insane. Then again, you know, maybe it really is down to the triumph of just revisionism and maybe we need to actually start this entire thing over again. I'm not saying that I necessarily subscribe to that view, just considering the possibility. I think that this discussion needs to happen. So many communist parties, I mean, and this is not just my personal judgment, I get this feedback from people around the world all the time, is like, most of the parties out there suck. Like, the standards are low, the morale is low, something needs to be done about that. And I'm sure that there are some Trotskyists listening to this saying, oh, we have the Fourth International. And my understanding is actually you have many fourth internationals because of the tendency and proclivity for splitting so much. I mean, it's, it's not what we need. To me, it seems like, you know, I'm not sure what the shift is going to be. I'm not sure where it's going to come from. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. But there needs to be some kind of shift. Now, the movement is growing. I think that that is indisputable. Many people in the last five to ten years have been going Marxist. That's just a fact, I think. Like, from the, you know, unofficial polls that I've conducted, it seemed like there was a clear trend towards more and more people trying to learn about socialism and communism, like, in the last three or four years in particular. And it seems like it's increasing year on year. That's great news. And I kind of think, uh, you know, probably it'll keep doing that for another few years. And then new organizations and bodies will start to crystallize out of that. That's just kind of what I what I would expect, because, you know, when you have uh, fewer people, you know, it's less likely that an organization is going to come out of it. After a while, though, you get thousands and thousands of people. Uh, there's enough of, you know, sort of each distinct group of thought for an organization to develop out of that. I think that that's going to happen. We may just need to keep this process rolling along, everybody doing the agitation and education that they can. Obviously, there are organizations that exist now. I mean, my stance while running this channel is that, uh, I mean, I have reasons that I don't want to endorse specific organizations. Um, anyway, I don't. That's the policy. Um, you know, and I've done a video a few months back where I said, honestly, at this point, you know, there's so many like really tiny far left organizations. I just can't recommend that people join those at this present time unless you really feel called to a particular one. First of all, there's probably some better organization that I don't know about. If I start recommending somebody join this small left group and it winds up imploding being a horrible drain on people's lives and not accomplishing any work. And there was actually this other organization out there that was of a similar size, but was healthier and then wound up doing great work. And I recommended the bad one over the good one that I didn't even know about. You know, I just, I can't in good conscience do that. Maybe you'll see me recommending organizations four or five years from now, but at the present time, I'd rather people just get, particularly people who don't have any experience, go into like, DSA, Fight for Marxist Positions, obviously these are compromised organizations that have a lot of sock dems in them, but go fight them. Go fight them. The Russian Social Democratic Labor Party back in the day had plenty of what we would call today sock dems too. Uh, the Bolsheviks fought them, and ultimately the Bolsheviks had great success. I'm not saying that this is one-to-one -one at all, because, you know, of course, we already have ostensibly communist parties existing that, you know, are analogous to the post-1917 split situation. Okay, that's fine. But I also think that, I don't know, let's say you have a communist party that's been around for a hundred years, and it's still saying, like, first we need to elect Joe Biden, and then there'll be a tide turning. I can't take that organization seriously. I'm sorry, but I don't, and I can't, and I won't. 
So yeah, my current recommendation is join what's active in your area, active with ties to the community, doing real work, not just a book club. You can do book clubs online. That's not sufficient to qualify as an organization. Something that's healthy, active, meets on a decent basis, has people who know what they're doing, where you can learn from their organizing experience, and is actually engaged in some kind of struggle that is valued by the masses in your community. Look for that. If it's just DSA, then fucking join it and just fight for Marxist positions. When people come up with social chauvinism, fight it. Just do it. Fight it. If you can't fight them, who can you fight? You know what I'm saying? Like, you practice. Particularly if you have no organizational experience, just get into something that's at least functional. So I'd rather see people just get out there, gain experience in a mediocre organization where you go in knowing that you have to fight, than to go in to a bad organization uh, with many illusions about how good it is. Because I think that you're going to learn less and waste more time and possibly come out more damaged from the entire experience, possibly turned off to being in an organization for years. That would not be the first time if that happened to you, okay? It's happened to many people. So yeah, get out there. Um, get some experience, even if it's half-assed. Don't join the Democratic Party, obviously, but just go somewhere where there are things happening. Learn what it's like to be part of it. Gain some experience, meet some people, network, have conversations. And like I said, the movement's growing all the time. There are more people becoming educated on this stuff. I think that then, three, four years from now, when we have this conversation again, you'll have networked with people there will be more options. There will be more projects popping up. So anyway, I guess I'm saying don't despair at the state of organizations today. Um, I think that this is an important topic because what are we talking about here? Unity of the working class against fascism. The United States is so fucked up right now. I mean, we really need to do something about it. And, you know, as I've expressed, I don't see the United States currently having anywhere near the organizational capacity to functionally do something about this, but we need to develop it and embrace strategies that are actually going to work, not embrace strategies that have just time and again led us around and around and around in a circle of like lesser evilism, etc. Anyway, let me stress, these are just my thoughts on the organizational situation in the United States today. It's evolving, and I'm not saying it's 100% accurate, but honestly, that's my best guess at what to do right now. It's not for anyone out there listening to take as gospel, not at all. It is my contribution to an ongoing conversation about what does the U.S. left need to do? What is the most effective thing we can be doing right now? And, uh, you know, in terms of organizations, I honestly think, you know, in this age where people are just spending so much time online, getting out, joining something, connecting with other people, even if it is in, you know, a only loosely socialist setting and doing the work that you can while getting your education, maybe, you know, directly from the text, like, you know, as uh, mentioned in this text, party schools are meant to educate people. We also have the Internet now, so you don't necessarily need that directly, although parties are going to give you their particular line that they're, they've been developing for whatever amount of time. Anyway, uh, to me, just getting people active at all people are so alienated and isolated and just atomized like lone individuals basically plugged into the matrix um you know getting people back out there network like i said i think organizations will come in the next few years from that and it's not going to be from me or you know any other person with a youtube channel necessarily uh it's going to come from more people learning about this stuff and then figuring out solutions where they are, addressing the conditions where they live. I don't think we're entirely there yet. That's not to say that some of the organizations that are around now aren't going to be really important in five or ten years. I think that some of them probably will be. Some of them probably won't be. But I guess the point is, I personally don't think we're really anywhere near critical mass yet, although we are getting closer. I think that the trend is clear in that direction, and I think we will start seeing more and more, uh, like I said, in the next... You know, there's a re I use that uh, hashtag. It'll maybe catch on someday. Anyway, I use hashtag Revolution 2030 or Rev 2030 uh, to represent the idea that I think that by 2030, we're going to see a significant 
movement happening with lots of real world mass involvement. Uh, but, you know, it's now 2022 and just 2022, barely. It's not even the end of the first month. I think that by pushing now, we're going to have by 2030 something that today would seem like unfathomable. You know, I think that the state of the movement then will be unrecognizable almost in a good way. That's my firm belief because I see more and more people coming. So I guess don't get too hung up on the organizations and conditions now. Just get out, do something, meet the people you can, have the conversations you can. Uh, and, you know, I do think that this will be figured out in that process. I have a lot of confidence in that. But, you know, continue your studies and translate what you learn into your current environment, your current social situation, your workplace, your apartment building, your community, whatever it is, your school. Put it into terms that people can understand. Hold events, you know, start a project of your own if there's something specific you can see forming. I mean, go for it. You know, we got to get out there and do it. Nobody's going to do this for us. And it really badly needs to be done. So not done badly, but needs badly to be done well. There we go. All right. I'm done. I'm out. Thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever works for you. Uh, every one of those donations is encouraging and also financially and materially helpful. So thank you all very much for those past and present. To help out the channel without becoming a patron, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting all help to boost the channel and to expand the audience, which is growing, so thanks to everyone who's been doing that. Leaving a comment, even if it's just good video or thanks, does help to boost the channel in the YouTube algorithm, so then more people see it. That's much appreciated. Like I said, join an org, see previous comments, or start a project of your own. Otherwise, stay safe. Thanks for listening again, and we'll catch you in the next video.